one of my earliest, earliest memories. My father was a teacher, and it seemed he always had these red pencils that the school board issued in his pockets. And I remember, and I must have been truly an infant because I wasn't mobile pulling this red pencil out of his pocket. Because like, these pencils were always around, and I used them. But I, but I had this inclination. I think two things, maybe not different than anyone else, but I remember being very visual. I was always looking at things, and particular things that interested me that still do, uh, birds and animals, and uh, just looking out, looking out of windows at trees, at the hills, at the mountains, at the Olympics across the strait in Victoria. So things I was always looking at, and I think the family was that way inclined, because we'd be out for a Sunday drive or something, so they'd have to stop the car and look at something. Ah, oh, a new view of Mountain Baker or something, and so it was just, uh, it was very normal. Um, when we say elementary, the early years depended so much on the instructor, and it wasn't as benevolent at time. Teachers were often quite terrifying, but, but some were more kindly and some were more inclined to give one. I was generally given credit for doing things well. But I remember once we were to do a crayon thing, as we agreed to, of the Olympic mountains. And I would see them, you know, with the kind of trees and green and the bottom and mucky. And I was made to stand in the corner because I didn't do these nice, perfect little kind of purple cones with little white tufts on top because I'd never seen a mountain that really looked like that. So I was trying to do the mountain the way I saw it. So I learned very quickly, you don't do that in school. So you sort of learn to do this kind of thing. But my inclination was always to, if I drew trees, it was never a ball on a stick ever. It was always to draw the leaves and the branches possibly put apples on it, because my aunt had apple trees in her orchard. Uh, and so it was really that kind of thing. And I like to do animals, like um, I fell in the lake in Beacon Hill Park in Victoria looking at a duck. Fortunately, there was a gardener there who grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and pulled me out. And it didn't bother me very much, but I remember very much the ducks, the, kind, the way the feathers sort of grew out of their heads, the wood ducks are prickly, and the rings around their necks, and all these things. So I saw things always in detail and interest, and I wanted to put it down. Really, then I, when I went to junior high school, suddenly we had art as a course. And I had a very good teacher, very, very, very nice fellow, and very encouraging. And at that time, I was about 12. And then when we went, went on to um, senior high school, I had an excellent woman teacher, excellent art teacher. And I really, really thank Frances Cameron. I think she directed my life a great deal. Their encouragement, um, I just sort of, this is what I was going to do. No, it was family decided I was going to, to do at least a year of university, so I did a year of university. Again, it was college, but it was a first-year university. And then I, I was quite lost for a while. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And uh, I just took one job and another job, worked here, worked there, left this and that. And uh, there was a sign. I was walking along the street in Victoria that said art classes. And Herbert Siebner had come from Berlin. And he was uh, setting up a studio in Victoria. And so I went upstairs to look, and I decided I liked this. And then I began taking lessons. Extra. And I'd also done some earlier with the Jan Zak and uh, uh, Ina Utoff, who was a Victoria artist. They were all very helpful, very helpful. So I did have a fair bit of training. But I found Herbert was probably the most influential, and in as much that I stayed with him for a couple of years. And then I felt I really had to, wanted to make this my life, not something I did after work at a job I didn't want to do anyway. Um, so I went to art school in Vancouver. I liked, I always liked to draw, but somehow it took on more and more significance as I went through my years of art school. And then after art school, when we moved, I was with my partner then, and we moved out of Vancouver as such and lived in North Vancouver, which was really very, very rural in the valley. And I was fascinated with the mountains, 
and there's suddenly this new environment. But it was such a different landscape than anything you know, I'd, I'd, anything I'd, I'd studied in art school. And I'm not an Emily Carr, and in that, oh God, how do I put this? Because I'm trying to think. I wasn't inclined to work in the form of the group of seven, which was very much, you know, they rebelled against the, ty the tyranny, really, the, of their time, but created, I feel, their own tyranny, that Canadian art looks like Group of Seven. And it wasn't my inclination to work like that. I saw things differently. And I think it was in Lynn Valley, this began to happen. I was basically trying to draw like Bruegel, for goodness sake. I mean, I think that's what happened. But probably there was a certain significance in the connection of things and just drawing this mass of undergrowth and mountains, the wild, wild, really very wild country that North Vancouver is. And I think that changed things a great deal. And each place we moved to after that, we moved further up Indian Arm. And I'd take my boat out and go out in a, a rowboat with my dog on the bow to hold it down, which is a good thing. He couldn't swim, poor thing, though. And I was, um, and I had a seagull engine on the back of it and I'd go up and down the inlet and, and sort of anchor the boat and take a raft to paddle to shore and work on the shore and until my day was done then paddle back in my raft <laughs> load the dog and so on. It was quite an expedition. Um, but I worked that way and uh, for two years we lived there and you know my trying to say is whatever my environment is, I'm drawn to it in the imagery that I that I which like words create, but that I make in the drawings that I do yeah, relate exactly. very much to, to my environment of the time. We moved to Richmond, and again, it was working from the dikes and this very, very open country. So, so extremely different from North Vancouver. It was like going into another world. When we left Richmond, um, we um, moved to Oyama, the idea that we would have a, an orchard. We would live from the orchard, but I like apples. I love apples, but I don't like picking apples all day. And I, it was not my calling at all, and uh, my partner felt the same. Um, so we decided we would move to something that was actually more rural, more rural than Oyama. And uh, we found this particular property, um, which, oh yes, the property itself, the houses and so on, we didn't think much of, but the view is spectacular. And that's what I look at. Then I think, oh, the house, yes, it needs a little repair. And so that's how we actually moved there. And then um, we sort of, we're still there. Put it that way. Well, I, I hand sharpen the pencil. I still have the knife, which I acquired when I was at art school. It is truly an antique thing. It's wonderful. It's one of these utility knives, but it's heavy, heavy, heavy metal thing. And I think the, the weight of it gives it a great balance because it's, um, it's just super for, for sharpening my pencils. And it, it's quite time consuming. The sharpening in itself is um, you know, quite, quite a task. And uh, I'll sort of wrap them in bundles and hit them sort of upright so I'm not going to break them on the way out because the worst thing you can do is if your pencil's all sharpened and drop the box or something. Because um, I have to have them very, very sharp. Well, I, I sort of, you know, seek places out. As soon as something, something really um, attracts me or draws me, well, you know, draw it. And I find these particular areas, you've got to know them, and, and it's always changing. The growth changes, and when trees come down, trees grow up, all that sort of thing makes quite a difference. Plus, um, my interests of the times will change, of course, too. It, it's sort of hard to describe um, the assumed way as you work from the general to the particular. Well, I don't. I work more particular and I've established the general afterwards, but it's from very often small, small things, sort of a nucleus of something that grows, you know. And it is rather almost feeling like you with the branches and all the leaves and the twigs and and the same thing, sort of the sky things. You almost feel these clouds and the way they push on the mountains, and the mountains almost move. It's um, and the more I get into the drawing. You realize there's more and more activity. What would appear to be a very um, 
uh, did I say, uh, a very still environment, but suddenly it is so animated. And you find all these things as they work. Sort of drawn more and more into that particular subject or uh, situation. Um, now, what do we well, first of all, I, I, so men as I mentioned with the ducks, I liked I liked drawing animals when I was a you know a youngster. I was you know, very horsey, and I loved drawing horses. You know, horses were in a way a part of the environment because you know the the um, the bread didn't come in a truck. The baker, you know. Bread came to the house, and it came in a little wagon, and the horse pulled the wagon. The same with the milk, and various things. Uh, so horses were always there, and then I had riding lessons when I was young, and so we went out to the horses. And this was very much part of it because I, I drew them constantly, and it was you know finally in later when I was sort of in my teens, and it was um, that. The dread of becoming like a horse specialist, you really wouldn't be an artist because you find a way to do something. And this is quite true. And so it was basically through my teaching with uh, Zach, with Jan Zach particularly, that you don't see things in a set way. You see them more as volume in space, because Zach was a sculptor. And I, I think that was a, a very significant part of my learning. You know, you, sometimes you're told a lot of things. They don't really make too much sense. But this really connected with me as seeing something almost uh, without a label. It was a form, a form in space to be sort of discovered and depicted. And once it started, I moved away from one specific thing because you no longer a specialist in a particular department. You basically knew nothing about anything and you draw to learn. And when I moved more into, more and more inclined to drawing than painting, I, simply because I found I could see more through drawing, I could discover more through drawing. It was for me very, very exploratory, and felt the importance of being able to go to something and continue working from it, go back to it again and again. I went on, a, when I really became absolutely engrossed with landscape, that's when I took a, actually a motor trip with my aunt around in the early, middle 50s, I think it was. No, pardon me, late 50s. And I was suddenly looking at this incredible landscape through um, the American Midwest, and through Yellowstone, and to uh, South Dakota. And I kept thinking, and my aunt was very tolerant. We'd stop the car, and I could make sketches and so on. This was great. I thought if I could ever just be somewhere where I could study this thing, and I, this particular this scene, this mountain, this situation, and draw it over and over and learn more about it. It just felt too, uh, too, um, too light, too uh, you know, passing through, and not enough focus on it. So when. Uh, we moved to Lynn Valley. That's when I really became aware of a place, the place you return to day after day, and you learned more about it and discovered more about it. And uh, this, um, this just became a part of my, my way of working, no matter where I went. So when I went to Falkland, this was part of it. And you mentioned the goats. I'm kind of prattling a bit, but as it comes up, the drawing. Um, Animals was very, very part of my early thing. And even when I was at art school, I'd spend more time at the zoo than in the class, because I found really the cougars and the um, ostriches and things were far more interesting to draw than, uh, than somebody sitting there in a G-string. You know, it really wasn't to me that exciting an experience, or, or pots and pans and these dreadful still lives you had to draw. They're very sterile. So um, I didn't always go over too well. But that's sort of where my interest in, in drawing from anim animals came from. And uh, when we moved, I think the fact that when we moved to Oyama, I had a place I could put a larger thing. Until then, it was like we'd get chickens. I used to borrow them from the zoo when I was at art school living in the West End and take them back again. Um, 
and I had and I had got lizards. I remember getting an iguana to draw and, and another iguana. They didn't survive too well. And uh, cages of birds. So I finally could get something bigger. And I wanted the idea of an animal with horns and hooves. I thought this would be very exciting. And it was decided a cow would be too big. So we looked for a goat. And so I had quite a, quite a time finding a goat that had horns, as I wanted the really, because people practically removed the horns. And so I finally found my goat after going up and down the valley. And uh, so, I, so I worked from it for a full, I remember a full winter and outside at that time in the in a shed and drawing the, the single goat there were pen drawings and then um, the goat had the goat had the family and then i found other goats and you know um, generally we ended up with six or eight of them most of the time pets i i can't say more than that generally they say well you raise goats you're sort of a goat no 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 they, they were pets and um and I drew them. And then periods I didn't and periods that I did. But the idea of the herd came from just the grouping of them and the way they, they would move. And it had this almost, I think, landscape quality about it. The animals almost fitted into the landscape, into one another, this sort of shifting of um, you know, one animal to the next. And I worked from those for um, several years again, from about 84. Uh, two in 1990, and about five years that they, they worked. But on, at that time, only in the summer. And then in the winter, then I was generally working from people. They're quite interchangeable, the way people. And, oh, I'm sure. I think it's formed me totally. It, I, I, I do believe that without doubt. Um, I think there's no question. Because uh, every aspect, really, of my existence is, is serving my art. You know, what I do, what I don't do, how I begin my day, how I manage my day, uh, everything. It's, it's in a way, it's very, it's so, you know, I could really, I say it's so simple. I love to draw. I truly have a passion to draw. I have to draw. I once something about dance. I don't know anything about dance. I was forced to ballet as a kid. It was a total loss for all of us. And so it didn't last very long. Um, but um, I, I don't know. You just have to do it. And it's the, the, the dancers, it's not who is the best, but who has to. And I think that's with most anything. And sometimes people that really have to struggle for something, it doesn't necessarily come easily. But you, it's meaningful enough that you will struggle. Because I never find it easy. You know, I was considered blah, 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 talented. but. I so deviated from that sort of path of doing nice things that were talented to, uh, to not so nice things that I was struggling to, uh, you know, to grapple with. And uh, so I, I think that's far, far more important. First of all, that you see something in the first place, and and and, f and really feel it. It's, it's you know so desperate that you have to going to sit and be very uncomfortable sitting on kind of a thin, hard blanket on the ground. And it's amazing how these rocks seem to rise up after a while that were <laughs> you didn't notice at the beginning. So well, they've moved up through the ground. And you know, it's, um, I always find it's really a, a hanging on sort of thing. It really takes stamina and the more and more and more that one demands of oneself. But it's, I find it extremely important if I'm going to, going to do something with this and I want to, so. But I am. Um, I feel that our, like the world I grew up in, you know, it's, it was, for one thing, it was depression. People didn't have a lot. You had to make very much of your own entertainment. Uh, there was no television. Radio was just coming in. Um, a movie was something. Oh, you very rarely saw it would ruin your eyesight. Anyway, so you, you didn't go to a movie very frequently. So basically, one invented, one made their own made their own uh, entertainment, they developed their own interest in the world, it was very physical. And I think a lot depended on imagination. <clears throat> when I was very little, <clears throat> I liked a book that had pictures in it. But as I got older, I didn't want pictures in a book. I wanted to create my own imagery from what I read. 
I, I think things come very made now. I really don't know because I, I don't have children or grandchildren. So in a way, I'm not part of that world. But from what I see that's out there and the way people amuse themselves, I think um, our, our world was just simpler. And it depended so much more on your, your physical, physical abilities. Just you know, to get through a day, it wasn't. Um, something very specialized, but you learn, you had to use your hands and... It's, it's amazing to me. It really is amazing. And uh, my partner and I often discuss this because his early life was, he was born in Germany. We lived in very in rural, and I was here in urban. But just the difference of our worlds to what is today, you know, I, I think we're like, you'd be different people. Uh, I think people today would just be very, very, very different, motivated by different things, skills that we did not have. And then they will lack skills probably that we did have. I think it's quite amazing that your cursory writing is now a questionable subject. I can't imagine not wanting to make lines or make marks, but just punch buttons. I hate it. I don't have a computer. I don't like the image in the computer. I don't like these flat digital. This, this, this sort of, uh, this kind of form of reality, to me, it, it's anything but. So I say I like the physical, tangible world that I can see and hear, and because it's just more than a flat image. And when I am, then I'm interested in the air. I'm interested in the depth, and you know, the spacing of things in the space. Someone once asked me when I was working from people. How did I feel? Well, I said, when I start out, because I would work on very big drawings, I feel like I'm on the rack and I'm going to die there. I'm just stretched and everything hurts. And it seems so impossible, so difficult. And then suddenly it just starts, you lose complete. I mean, it's, uh, it's not, it doesn't become easier, but it becomes possible. It's like suddenly you're connecting, you're, you're finding something that some other, this kind of energy. But it, it's so hard to explain without the idea of, well, you know, I, I don't like sort of what I call sort of uh, self-appointed mystics and so on. I think that's a bit yucky. And I, I don't mean that, but there is some point where um, things start to flow, because otherwise I just couldn't do it. I couldn't, you know, you couldn't put in the time in that way. So yes, I, I agree with you, there is.